All right, how's this, how's this crazy thing where there it is right there, that's the camera right there. Hello everybody, Mark Worman, Graveyard Cars. I hope you've enjoyed your vacation. Uh, since I've seen you last while you were playing house, I have been working on putting engines and cars together for the most beautiful Mopars on the planet. Spread the word, Graveyard Cars is back. The world is littered with the decaying bodies of forgotten muscle cars. At Graveyard Cars, a restoration shop in Springfield, Oregon, no car is too far gone or past its expiration date to get a new lease on life. Leading the group of Mopar morticians is Mark Warman. My name is Mark Warman and I own Graveyard Cars. What we do at this shop is we restore Mopar muscle cars to exactly the way Chrysler intended them to be on the day they were built. Anybody in the world can bolt aftermarket parts on a car, order a truckload of parts, put them on, put a bow on it, and say, there you go, it's done. But only a handful of guys in the world can do what we do. You may not like that, you may not like me, but that doesn't change the facts. Heroes and villains, sinners and saints. If you didn't have Mark Warman, you'd have to invent him. At Graveyard Cars, you won't find many mods or aftermarket parts, but you will see a team of hardworking technicians dead set on restoring these cars back to their factory specifications. I'm Will Scott, the painter here at Graveyard Cars. I cover everything from paint work to light body work and doing everything we can to make sure these cars look perfect. Hi, I'm Dave Ray. My job here at Graveyard Cars is uh, the assembly part of the process. As soon as it comes out of the body shop, uh, and all the drivetrain suspension gets put in it, uh, I basically build out the car. My name is Alyssa Rose, and I have about a thousand jobs here at Graveyard Cars. I am human resources, I am historian, I help keep inventory of all the cars. I'm also apprenticing out in the body shop. My name is Royal, here at Graveyard Cars. I kind of do anything that needs to be done. Lately, I don't do much. <laughs> Sorry. I'm really tired, so it's, it's hard for me to keep a straight face. Um, my favorite color is green. Dark green metallic, GG1. Mark calls it baby beep green. To restore one of these cars, Mark and his team decode its vehicle identification number and build sheet. To do this, they use original equipment reproduction parts to replicate its exact appearance the day it rolled out of the factory. This next season's gonna be great. We got the shop rolling. I mean, we we're, we're got it over a year underneath of our belt. We're still getting out some little kinks. We have some deadlines coming up that uh, are, are worrisome for any shop owner. The deadlines, are, I, I'm sure, are gonna be tighter. We got a whole graveyard full of cars. As the deadlines get closer, typical fashion out of Mark, I'm sure he'll be out here going back crazy. Everything will get kind of a mess. There is an amount of stress that comes with that and making sure that everything's done the right way and you know, we're not just pushing cars out of here and getting them done by their deadline, but that everything's still getting done the right way. So it's do or die time. I mean, we're either gonna get these cars done on time or we're not. And if we don't, that's definitely gonna affect our reputation. There is no tolerance for failure. You make yourself push harder and faster, even though there's plenty of time. And that is when mistakes can happen. Mark lives on the deadline edge, so it's nothing new, but we'll get it done. We always do. The most powerful cars can't live forever but a limited number of Mopar muscle cars will get a second chance at life. On this episode of Graveyard Cars, the ghouls team up to install the exhaust for our 1971 Phantom Cuda. These go in really easy. Now, Tom from Accurate Exhaust that makes these, his daughter puts one of these on in half an hour by herself. What are you trying to say? Will preps to paint the very difficult FK5 burnt orange on a 1970 Plymouth Cuda. Um, you really don't know how a transparent color is. I mean, you do a spray out card, and yes, that'll tell you a little bit, but until you get the car sealed and get that first coat on, you really see what you have to deal with on how many coats it's gonna to take to cover. Dave and Alyssa race to wrap up the back end of our Phantom Cuda. Put in the exhaust tips, swing the gravel pan in there, and put all the rest of the hardware on. Okay. And Mark receives three brand new restorations that are in such great condition, the team is tempted to take them on a road test saying, you know, back in the day, uh, out on the cruise strip, you'd see cars like this, exactly the way they look. Coming up on this episode of Graveyard Cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that the Cranberry dead are coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman, 
and together we bring dead muscle cars back to life. To exactly the way they were on the day they were born. Over the last 13 weeks, a lot has been accomplished. Work is nearly complete on the one of one 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. Bill Goldberg was given a jackhammer reveal for his stunning 1968 GTX convertible. And soon after, Brett Torino's ultra rare one of seven 1967 Hemi GTX convertible was finished and delivered. All the while, the car that started it all, our legendary 1971 Phantom Cuda, received its first coat of paint and a newly built out, date correct engine, making it the first time in 30 years that this car has had a running motor under its shaker hood. And to top it off, our gold 1972 Charger's first test drive went flawlessly and was delivered to yet another happy customer. Right now I rounded up uh, Dave and Alyssa. We're getting ready to put the exhaust system on our 71 Phantom Cuda. Poor Dave's usually stuck out here working by himself, but every chance we get, we're gonna jump in, give him a hand on putting stuff together. So right now that's what we're getting ready to do. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You lay it out, it's all marked left it makes and right. Makes us look really, really good. It does. You yeah. don't have to guess, we don't have to do anything. It's laid out, it's ready to go. What do you start with the right side? Yep. Pass for say. So Alyssa, yeah. yep. I'm gonna let you fit the head pipe to the manifold. For 1970 and 1971, Every model of the Plymouth Cuda received a different exhaust system depending on its factory installed engine. These go in really easy. Now, Tom from Accurate Exhaust that makes these, his daughter puts one of these on in half an hour by herself. What are you trying to say? If it came equipped with a 383 two barrel, the car would have been fitted with a single exhaust. If the vehicle had received a 383 four barrel, it would have been fitted with a dual exhaust system. Okay. Okay. okay, if you look up in here, you'll see that Dave's already got the bolts coming down through there along with the uh, exhaust flange gasket. Okay. So this, if you look at it, Dave will want to walk a little bit to the inside of the car with it right there. Guide those nicely. Interestingly, every factory installed single system exhaust did not get factory installed tips. Oh, hang on, Alyssa. This one's got to go. Yes, there we go. We don't want to stick back. I haven't done any exhaust work at all before, nope. but I am excited to work on our Phantom Cuda because it's the car that started it all. So yep. I'm ready to learn. You were six years old when I got that car. Really? Yeah, how old are you? 25. 25. You were 18 when I got that car. Just a kid wrecking cars, carelessly wrecking cars. Oh my gosh. For dodging phantom cats that ran a, hey, that's kind of clever. Phantom Cuda and you dodged phantom cats that didn't exist. <sighs> Because you were fighting with your boyfriend, Tuna Boy. Not right there. So this one with the serrated teeth, oh, it goes cool. on like that right there. So go ahead and put that on. Oh, okay. okay there we go. Got her started? Yep. There you go, Alyssa. Here, take this, Alyssa, right there. So this slides over this right here, and then it uses a clamp to hold it in place. And that there you'll actually just put on there. On this end of it? Yeah, and that should slide right over that. And then this, we're going to turn to the outside just a little bit. The we'll muffler go. clamps basically can go anywhere you want them to go, Alyssa. Yeah. But these up here, because they're a little bit lower than the muffler, I like to turn them up to the side, and the factory did as well. So you can get on these things really nice with an impact and really wrap them down good. Okay. And yet at the same time, they won't hit anything. I'm getting ready to primer the trunk on our 1970 Burn Orange Cuda. Since we do all the pre-paint on the quarter panels and the wheelhouses, the only downfall to that is when you go to primer the inside, we have to mask it off. So I've got that side masked off. I'm gonna mask up this side real quick so we don't get any overspray on the nice painted stuff. And then uh, it'll be ready for primer. When we work on the inside of the cars, we have to treat them just like the outside. So we put a new floor pan in it, got it all welded up, grinded out nice, uh, did a little body work to it. So it's actually, as soon as the primer cures, it's actually ready to go in there, scuff it, and get color going on it. So essentially, this is just doing the same thing that we already did in the cab. Uh, it doesn't really get boring 
doing the same thing over and over because we're not, you know, I'm not painting a car every two weeks. You know, in each car we do is different and each car is, is perfect when it leaves. So it's not like in the collision world where you just paint one after another and get it out. Time has to go into each one, thought process, steps, how can we do the next one better? So things are constantly changing with each car that we do. I just finished the primer. I only put two coats on there. Uh, we're not trying to really cover much. So I got two coats on there, that'll dry. And that's the last primer that we have to do on this car. So once this is fully cured out, we'll start blocking on it and get some of the jam work done. And then eventually we'll be on the outside of the car. Yeah, what I'm gonna do is, this clamp has gotta go on like this. I'm gonna go ahead and tighten that down. This one's just gonna stay straight on? Yeah, and then we have to slide another pipe in there so we don't wanna tighten that yet, but okay. it should hold that yep. set up in there. Whew. This is the over axle pipe. And it should be marked right hand and left hand. Okay. So this one's gotta go over the axle. So the shape of this is very unique. You see all the bends in it? Mm -hmm. It's not just a U shape. It comes this way and goes that way and then goes up over. As you'll see when he puts this up in there. Yep, okay, set Dave. that up in there. There's not a lot of room around. Is there. that all we got on that jack mark? Or no? I can come down some more. Yeah, we'll have to play with it here and see. All right, is this the next piece? Yep. And that'll go right here. Keep it. This here. So after this, do the tips go on next? Or do we save those for last? Uh, the tips will actually save uh, when we do the rear volants. Unfortunately, on the CUDA, these, there's a cutout in the rear volants that the actual exhaust tips go through. Oh, okay. So we're gonna build out the back end, put the back bumper on, then we'll do the voyance and then we'll do the tips. So we're just basically hanging the exhaust up to the exhaust tips. Okay. Hey, that looks nice. Hey! <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a tool There in he is, the prodigal son returns just in time to take credit for the job. Hi, Royal. I got here just in time today to help put the last half of the exhaust on with Melissa and Mark and Dave. Hi, Royal. Oh, there we go. Hey, this Look is my that. specialty. Huh? Where you been? Working. Mm -hmm. Working on my other two jobs. How come you weren't here this Working. weekend when we were moving stuff around and moving parts from one pod to another and sweeping the parking lot and pressure washing? How oh, come you're here for... that was what the free lunch was. Mm. <laughs> Son of a. I believe what do you need you, help with? What do you need help with? <laughs> let's get this uh, done. Get the head pipe over there and let's start putting that on. Alyssa can help you. Okay. No matter how you do it, you can have the whole thing done. He'll just, ironically, like when we were kids, when mom would cook dinner, he'd just show up. Like he's walking down the road and smelt it. Uh, putting the exhaust in is a five minute job when you have this many hands and you got a system like accurate exhaust. I just don't believe, I've known well, you Royal yeah, my whole life. The reason I met Royal is because he go. quit his paper route when he was 13. And I said, why are you quitting your paper route? Don't you need a little bit of, mm, you know, a little bit of yeah, Bunsen burner, nice little learner? Yeah, she's got it. I need my space, he says. Yeah, those hands 13, are what kind of space that, do you need? I know, that's why I had her do it. Anytime my dad feels like he has an audience, he seems to be, more focused on entertaining that audience than whatever the task was before they arrived. So yeah, Royal showed up and that was kind of the end of working for my dad. Well, I got a 19 inch wiener. Uh, yeah. Eat no, a 60 no, ounce I didn't say anything about wieners. <laughs> I just, There's the wiener. Did you wiener hear about cheeseburgers? It's always okay. about the wiener. Royal's not here a whole lot, so I understand that that's one of my dad's best friends. He wants to, you know, catch up, but. Nice to have the whole team back together working. It is, it's great, especially yeah. working on this car. This is cool. Right. Well, this is the bad boy. This is the one, man. Yeah. So exciting. I cannot wait to drive this car. Oh yeah. Of all the cars I've ever driven, this one is the one that was never supposed to see daylight again. <laughs> you know, that, that so, was the word. So they said. Never gonna be on the road. I think the exhaust looks great. It's level. You got my seal of approval. It looks pretty cool, huh? Yeah. The it's truth crazy. is, you probably could do that. If I took yeah. it all back off, you could actually bolt it on there. That's good. Oh, yeah. It's not heavy, so I, it's easy. Yeah. Easy to work with. And easy to work with. I can, could do it by myself. Winning team. That's yeah. what you get out of graveyard cars. Yep. Yeah. New Marino. Everybody give them the grin. Bro. 
getting ready to start painting our 1970 burnt orange Cuda. It's the pre-paint, so I have just the body in the booth right now. So I'll get the body sprayed, the jams done at the same time. Mark struggled with this color, so I'm a little nervous if it's gonna be hard, but I'm pretty confident I can get it to come out great. From this point forward, it's gonna be a struggle in every aspect. Mark did the color himself on the burnt orange charger. Uh, that, that took a lot and trying to duplicate that exactly isn't the easiest task on top of the fact it's a hard color to paint. So I think it's gonna be really challenging from this point forward. A man who has committed a mistake and doesn't correct it is committing another mistake. Confucius. I don't, I have no clue why he put a note on the toner. I don't even understand what it means. So I just finished putting a nice coat of sealer over the whole car. It finishes, it kind of fixes little, the little scratches, sand scratches that might be in there. So the sealer kind of gives it a nice even coat, so to speak, over the whole car before I start putting my color on. While the sealer dries, Dave Ray preps to install the glass in our legendary 1971 Phantom Cuda. Yeah, I got all my pieces uh, together for the driver's door. I got to build out the glass. Uh, the glass will actually take, uh, you know, some stops actually in the glass. It takes a couple little bushings that the lower track screws to, as well as a couple little slides that I got to put on the glass. But I go ahead and put in my regulator and my rear track. I just kind of lay uh, kind of in the corner of the door, kind of get those pieces in there and kind of out of the way. And then my uh, main track, I'll actually slide onto the glass and drop it all in in one unit. Uh, missing some components, as always. With the Phantom Cuda, this car had absolutely nothing. I got some of the parts. I'm missing a bunch of others, so I'm gonna head out to the graveyard and take a look at our parts cars and see what I can dig up. We have our 1970 Cuda. Yeah. 440. Uh, 440. Uh, six pack? Six barrel. Same thing. Yeah. Um, no. And we're gonna kind of... Sorry. So th this car is going to FK5 Burnt Orange. It's a hockey stick, too. So we're gonna kind of go over the pre-paint, why we do the pre-paint, uh, just the fact that I really don't agree with doing the pre-paint at all. I never really fully understood why he insists on us doing a pre-paint. Well, no, I mean, first of all, don't confuse people, okay? This is a tech tip about why pre-paints are important, and why I demand them. We could talk about the fact that it creates an undercoat for the final paint, or we could talk about why we're really doing it. Because you. you. This is your baby, this is your enchilada. No offense with the hat. This, this is your baby, all right? Your baby. Pre-paints are my fault? Absolutely. Pre-paints have nothing to do with me. So I think is what the next car that we do, we'll just try to do 2007, without. young guy, painter working for me. 69 Dodge Coronet RT, <laughs> 440, four speed car. This is a Ram Charger car. I was car. a kid. I says to him, make sure that when you paint these panels, that they all match each other. Don't just pre-paint this one, don't paint this one over here, this one over here, and then bolt them together and hope it matches, because it isn't magic, right? Make sure that they all match. Do a spray out on every one of them. Remember that? I, remember I can have it read back to you. No, I'm pretty sure it sounds good, boss. Sound good, yeah. So then, two days before the people are here to pick up the car, we bolt the fenders and the doors on it, only to find out, voila, it's the wrong color. The quarters don't match the deck lid. Deck lid doesn't match the doors. I mean, it looks like a can of Skittles. All right, I got every color in the rainbow in there. Oh, just... A lucky charm dude to go crazy. Orange, moons, pink hearts, green clovers, all that stuff. Anywho, that is the pioneer. That is the genesis of pre-painting. You paint the car one time, he can pre-paint this quarter panel and body at one time with his FK5 burn orange. Then he can go do the doors. Then he can go do the fenders. And he can wait a year. I was a kid when that happened. Um, wait two years every... if he wants to. Lesson so, adjourned. 
I hope everyone at home that helped you with your tech tip. I don't know if it did, but it kind of gave you a basic well, idea of what is in on the tech tips. So don't try to upstage. It's not hard to do. So, anyways, I hope that helps you guys at home. We'll uh, try to get a cleaner version of a tech tip in the future for you. With Mark finally out of the way, Will can spray out the first coat of FK5 Burn Orange. This car is awesome. We did this color on a Charger, and the Charger looked beautiful. But now we're doing it on a smaller Cuda, which I think it's gonna just look absolutely amazing. This is a difficult color. Um, it's a very transparent color, meaning it takes a lot of coats to cover, on top of the fact that it can model. Now when I say model, that means where the metallic kind of groups together if you don't lay it out right, and it kind of looks zebra-striped. Meanwhile, Dave continues to work on the glass for the Phantom Cuda. So I went outside and grabbed a parts door for the passenger side of the car, so I'm gonna pull that glass out of that door and get the, the pieces I actually need, get them detailed out, and uh, keep moving forward. It's never fun taking a door apart when it's laying down. Always a pain in the butt. We're gonna do the best we can and, and get out as many pieces as we can, so. The most time consuming part about doing the glass is detailing all the parts. Uh, we don't buy all brand new parts and just take them out of a box and put them in the car. We use all original equipment. Everything in these doors uh, involving the glass and the mechanisms in this car are all 1971. That's the whole key is to try to make it look as original as we could and make it last. Yeah, the first thing I want to do uh, is get this lower track bolted onto the actual glass. Once that lower track goes onto the glass, it kind of stabilizes the glass. And then it's pretty easy on the front part. I just bolt in that front track and then I work in the back track and hook it up. One, two, three, it's done. Mark will look at it. He's going to be a little distraught that it went so easy for me. I've spent the last few months getting the machine shop, the engine assembly area, dialed in. Uh, we've got lots of parts here, we've got pieces in stock that we never had before that are allowing me to be able to build these out over a course of a weekend and get ahead of the game. In fact, I'm about seven engines ahead of the rest of the shop. So what I want to do is I want to get over to the body shop and help them. The body shop is really kind of our uh, bottleneck right now at Graveyard Cars. They need some direction, they need some, uh, well frankly, they need a little pick-me-up, you know what I'm saying, a little motivation, and that's what I do. So well, you just go put a couple more posters out there for them. You know, motivational posters, I think they like the nickname, so I'll probably come up with some of those. But, but besides that, I'll be working desperately hard on helping them dial in the body in the paint shop area. I want her to write down the notes because I know where I'm at right now on these things. I want to be able to tell that to Mike so he can finish putting everything together in here. Instead of him trying to guess where we're at, there will be a nice punch list for him to be able to finish out the rest of these assemblies. Okay, this is our 69 and a half A12 for Johnson, so you can just put down 446 pack Johnson. Okay. We have two decals that need to be ordered for the air cleaner. I have photographs of them in the file. Decals for air cleaner. The 69 and a half A12 engine is nearly done. I had a chance to work on that last week. I really got to a point where I was just waiting for the distributor to come back from Harms so we can put it in and the spark plug wires to get in from Classic. And once that's done, other than a couple little things, that complete drivetrain will be wrapped up. Okay. Distributor, spark plug wires, and that one's done. Everything else is on this one. We even got the date coded alternator on there. That's how we roll. Just put Kowalski. How do you spell that? <laughs> K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I, Kowalski. According to the director of the film Vanishing Point, it was 20th Century Fox's studio executive, Richard Zanuck, who came up with the idea of using the brand new 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. Doesn't have a first name. That's the character from the movie, remember? Cleavon Little was talking to him on the radio. The last! Free spirit, blooded American. I don't know, he gets crazy. He's going on a little. Featuring the Challenger center stage, endeavored to return the favor for Chrysler, providing Fox with rental cars for only a dollar a day. The drivetrain is going to be done for it as soon as we get the transmission back and Mike finishes building it out. It's almost done anyway. Five Alpine white Dodge Challenger RTs were lent to the production. 
four were equipped with manual 440s, and the fifth was geared with an automatic 383. We do have a correct Dana for it that still needs to be built. We've got an 18 spline transmission getting custom built from Brewers with a two speed overdrive in it because we're going to make the drive from Denver, Colorado to San Francisco in the same time Kowalski did in the movie. So we want this car to be able to run a buck 60. Vanishing Point premiered in January of 1971, and director Steven Spielberg named it as one of his favorite films. Yeah, this is a lot. My dad's just rattling off numbers. I don't even know what I'm writing down, honestly, anymore. I don't know what's going on. I'm confused. Okay, so train, transmission emperors. Yes, and then <laughs> once that's on, and transmission cross member, that'll finish that drivetrain out. What kind of car is this gonna go in? This is going in 1970 Dodge Challenger RT Alpine White, EW1's the paint code made famous by Mr. Kowalski in a movie called Vanishing Point. Our 1970 Dodge Coronet RT 426 Hemi 4-speed, it's all done for practical purposes. PCV hose is already on. I want him to call Tony D'Agostino and double check the routing of this hose right here. Somehow it's got to get to there and I need to know what the OEM correct routing is for that. So basically, my dad and I walked around each engine and transmission that he's already built out and made notes of everything that he had left so that when Mike comes in, he can kind of look over the notes and take over where my dad left off. Very manageable right now. I think Mike will be able to go through here. He doesn't get interrupted as much as I do, so my guess is a week or two, he'll be able to wrap all these up. Yeah, we only have about a month, <laughs> actually, until we're supposed to have yeah. this car done. So we're getting close to the deadline. Um, it's really exciting that we're actually gonna get to work on it finally and get some of the stuff on. We've gotta do it kind of quick, so yeah. hopefully we get it open. All right, we got a rear gravel pan, got a rear bumper, got our exhaust tips here. So we're basically gonna put the bumper on first, then we're gonna hang our gravel pan from these two little center points right here. Okay. Because if we put the gravel pan all the way on, we're not gonna be able to get our exhaust tips in there. Okay. So we'll do this first, these two, put in the exhaust tips, swing the gravel pan in there, and put all the rest of the hardware on. The bumper looks beautiful, look at that. Looks cool. Yeah, it came out nice and even, got a nice reveal, got our tips, and we'll do final adjustment on the tips because we'll have to move the mufflers too. Uh, so right now, we'll go ahead and put in our tail lights, so okay, that'll be awesome. really cool. So we'll start with these. These things are beautiful. Will did a great job painting the bezels, as he always does, so it matches the whole back end. So this piece here will kind of go from the inside, okay. and then this one will slide in, and they'll just kind of compress themselves together. So oh. this will be on that other end. Grab these. Okay. All right. You actually have to feed that, I think, into this. Oh, okay. And you can kind of see these little pin spots. Yeah. So you slide that in there. We already got our gaskets and everything on there. How does it look? Looks Pretty good. good. Yeah. No foam showing or anything. Nice. Those taillights look sweet, don't they? Yeah. That looks cool. It's looking that just really good. Totally made the back end of the car. This is cool. Oh, this is gonna be so cool. So our man, Tony, has an awesome set of gills. He has actually the right set, the correct set. Oh, those are and awesome. And Mark's been over this a bunch of times, how it has that black border around the edge. Mm -hmm. So he does a fantastic job on his reproductions. They're like perfect. Do these have any functionality or are they just all for looks? Just all for looks, yeah, no That's functionality awesome. and stuff. But yeah, just for looks, being that it's a CUDA. They kind of changed it up. In 1970, they had like the gills on the rocker molding. And then in 71, they went to a straight molding and then brought the gills up into the, the actual fender, which makes it look more like a fish having the gills up in there. And what I like to do is put a little, I call it dum-dum putty. It's actually a ribbon, like for putting in windshields. A lot of the factory ones had a little gasket in here, you know, that works, but I end up using this little dum-dum putty. Oh, that's weird. So I cut off a little piece of that, and I put it in there. It kind of helps hold everything into place, and it seals it all off from getting any moisture in there and stuff. Yeah, you just kind of take a little strip and wind it on there. You don't want it too super thick, but just enough to make a nice little seal on there. So you got that on there, so we'll go ahead and get our brackets on there, set our gills in first, run the brackets, and then tighten her down. Okay. Now 
That doesn't look too bad, huh? That is like one of my favorite features on this car. That made it, it is, for huh? sure, yeah. 71 Cuda billboards and the gills. That's the only year that did it, and that would be the only year I'd want. I love the 71 Cuda. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and put our mirror in. This particular mirror, it just looks so plain because it's just a basic chrome mirror. Mm -hmm. You've seen that on a lot of these cars, these 446 barrel cars, four speed, uh, track pack car, just basically made to go fast forward. So a lot of these guys didn't want to pay the extra money for a fancy mirror, so they would just get whatever one came with the car as like the base price of the car because a left-hand mirror is required by DOT. You had to have a left-hand mirror on the car. So you see on some of the cars, they have the cool painted mirrors on both sides or they have a chrome uh, remote mirror where you can actually adjust it from the inside. But I mean, how much could it cost to add another mirror though? This is a 1971 car and equipment price book. I think it was like page 55 or something that the, the mirror was on. This would be the standard mirror, so it'd be no charge. So now the first upgrade would be, what is that, like a G31? Racing mirror remote control left, chrome. What's the price on that one? 14.95. Wow. So to have a really cool chrome racing mirror, which it looks a heck of a lot better than that, remote, 15 bucks. See, well, I guess back in 1971, 15 bucks was a lot of money, was a big deal. I guess deal. so, let's see. Engines, right here. Okay, well, let's see if you went to a 383. Okay, that is your standard engine. Mm -hmm. So it was $139 to basically get a CUDA package. Okay, now this one has a 446 barrel. So okay. the 446 barrel, what was that one cost? 253. So that's quite a bit of difference in money, you know, to go to a 446 barrel. That's the, really cool. The 426 Hemi yep. was $883 Gosh, more. That was man. probably a big, that's big, a big spender. That's a big chunk to put one. the Hemi in there. So that's why you don't see a whole lot of Hemis. People are like, man, that's a lot of money. So yeah. I'll, they would definitely go with the 446 barrel because it's a lot cheaper to upgrade to that. And you got 390 horsepower as opposed to 425. So I mean, you're it's still like kind of in that yeah. ballpark, you know. Yeah. That's yeah, a cool that's, book to this have. Is a that's cool neat. Book. Yeah, so that'd be something to kind of. It's really interesting to see the prices. Yeah, so you know, fun to see, play around yeah, with. Yeah, I wonder what the inflation would be like. Oh, nowadays. in today's day and age, that exactly. 426 Hemi would probably be like, what, $5,000? So I went and looked it up because I was kind of curious. And um, you were pretty close. You said 5000 and yeah. today it'd be 5200 Wow, that's not so, too bad. Yeah. So I was kind of curious about some of the other ones. Let's quiz you. Okay. Just for fun. What do you think the CUDA package was? So back in 1971, it was $139. What do you think okay. it'd be today? Oh, with inflation? Then, oh, uh, like 500 bucks? 825. Okay, how, what do you think about the 446 barrel upgrade? 446 barrel it was upgrade. $253. Oh, back in 1970, yeah. it was that much, huh? Wow. Uh, so that's gotta be over 1,000 bucks. Yeah, $1,503.37. Wow, jeez. Definitely do it, though. Yeah. The six pack. I would still definitely worth do it. that today. Yeah, still worth it. Kind of cool, cool how you could just walk in and customize your car. Yeah, yeah, and they like, had it so they can. Yeah, awesome. you can order it, you know, from the factory, and he would put whatever options you want on there. Uh, the car's looking amazing uh, right now. I mean, it's we got the gills in, and got the back bumper on, rear gravel pan, exhaust tips. I mean, we did a lot of stuff. All the marker lights. I mean, it looks cool. All right, fun, fun, fun doing the body plugs. Yeah, I don't know how they do it from the factory. I don't know if they got a pneumatic <laughs> tool or what, but obviously something easier than the way we're doing it. But yeah, the body plugs is like that one hurdle. You can't put any uh, sound deadener in until all those body plugs are in. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, kind of a good good hurdle to get over as the body plugs, even though they're no fun to put in, as you found oh, out. Oh, yeah, they're <laughs> a little harder than they look. You have to get the right angle. You know, you have to have accuracy and technique. You make it look really easy. Yeah. Got myself a couple times, but they're in. Yep. So yeah, that feels good. For your first ready time. For the, yeah. yeah, and we're ready for the interior, so that's really exciting. Uh, right now I'm out in the graveyard. I'm waiting for Mike and George to get back. I recently took in a restoration on a 1970 CUDA 446 barrel four-speed car. Really nice. For all practical purposes, almost looked like a driver type quality, but the, the gentleman who sent the car to me, his dad had given it to him. So it is here for a complete restoration so that it can look the way it was uh, on the day it was built. But additionally, he had two Barracuda convertibles, which I purchased from him at the same time. So right now I'm waiting for him to pull in so I can check out all the hardware. Bob Curious George! <laughs> look at that. Look at the lights in those. That's the coolest front end on the planet right there. Those park lamps up in the grill. Back Curious George, always changing teams. 
You're talking about a Barracuda convertible, 70 and 71, the only years they were available wow, in the e-body. You're talking rare, rare stuff anyway. Good. Are they as collectible as a Hemi car? No. You get down to like the Barracuda 318 three-speed, they only made 125 of those cars total. Uh, on the blue car, the Grand Coupe, they actually made 381 of those. So still very, very rare compared to the cars of the day. Oh, the badges are on it. I thought they weren't. I love those. That's the Grand Coupe Crest. Look at those wheels. Tell me that is 1979. Polyglass tires, eight inch rims in the back, sevens in the front. Look at the dish on that. Look at that. It's a blue Grand Coupe. The guy added a shaker to it. He put a 383 in it. Originally, it was a 318 automatic. In that lineup, they only made like 381 of those cars. So you're talking a very low demographic. And the Grand Coupe gives you all the luxury features. So that's a really neat one. 70 Cuda, 446 barrel, four speed. Oh, wow, that's clean. They've unloaded the vehicles, got them out in the middle of the lot, got them started up, running, uh, warmed up. All of them seem to run pretty darn good. Uh, I'm going to grab the team and go around the cars individually, kind of show them some of the little things that I know the differences between the Cuda and the Barracuda model and that blue Grand Coupe. So this guy added this shaker to this car, but I've looked at it and this is an original shaker. He must have bought it back in the day. Amazing. Like the AMD ones that we put on the Phantom Cuda, they're beautiful. They're, they're perfect. They're new metal, but they're subtle, very subtle little differences that tell you, if you look at one, what the differences are. And there's probably more than even I know about, but the first thing I always look at is this rib right along here. See one, two, three, four, five spot welds. Yep. If you go pop the hood on the green car, it's got five spot welds and five spot welds. But if you go take a look at our Phantom, there's only three. Wow. Okay. The difference in the metal and the way they stamp them today, you see this wrinkled area right here? Oh yeah. The metal had to go somewhere when they stamped it. Today's, they're cut, they're not stamped, so they don't have these. So if you go look at our Phantom, same basic shape, but you don't have these ribs it's in just there. It's, it's just smooth. It's just rolled right glassy in. Glassy smooth. Yep. That's really cool. And you can see it even protruding right there, yep. too. Another one is this mark right here. If you feel right there, you have a little bit of a bump from the transition from this and the sheet metal all moving around. Yeah. The aftermarket one is just smooth as can be through there. So those are subtle little differences. You see this is smooth here. There's no, there's no indentations here. All right. This is a 70 hood. After January 1st, 1970, when the cars were built, the Department of Transportation said, we want those hoods to fold. We don't want them to be that rigid. We want them to fold. Look at this rib right here. Yeah. And this rib right here. To make the hood fold That's up. That's 1971 on up. So what do we do with these cars? Are they look like they're already restored? No, the guys, they're just driver quality, but I'm trying to build up an inventory of cars so that we can have our graveyard motors, our used car lot. People that are buying these cars, let's say it's not somebody who inherited it from their dad. They're just looking for a 68 Roadrunner. Then who's gonna validate the car and make sure that it's a real 68 Roadrunner 383 four-speed car and that has the right numbers in it and that everything's right? I'm gonna create a 1970s dealership That's just awesome. like it was back in 1970. The salesmen have to wear polyester just back. Yeah, Cousin Eddie selling cars. We specialize in these cars that are for sale out there that we can buy an inventory, validate, make sure it's a real Roadrunner. If it's not a real Roadrunner, then sell it as a non-real Roadrunner. But give people that ability to be able to call us up and say, I'm looking for a 71 Cuda 344 speed car. Well, I don't have any of those that fit that right now. What I do have is I have a 71 Cuda that we can make into a 340. It's just another facet that I'm looking into doing. The two Barracudas, some other cars that I bought around here. So is the green charger going in this inventory to sell? Well, thank you for asking, Will. Yes, it is. <laughs> that no, that's funny. It's, it's all funny. <laughs> but it wasn't Where's for Mike? sale before that. No, no. Where's Mike? You said, no, you were going to be buried in that car. Right. Rewind. Right. Hey, whoever buys this is going to have to have a gun and a mask because it's not for sale. I don't know how many times I have to say that. It's not for sale. It is not Let's for get a, sale. We'll get a picture of it loaded up. Okay, you know what? Just for that, they'll bury me in the son of a I'm calling my attorney right now, and I'm having it put into my will. Buried in I that car. I needed cars for inventory. Oh. That's a perfect car for the inventory. This is the way the cars looked when we were in high school. So the ones that we're redoing now, we're redoing for nostalgia purposes to put them back the way they were on the assembly line. But every kid in high school drove a car with great big Kragers or appliance or slotted mags and meats hanging out past the fender wells, chewing up the back of the car. Back then it was all bias supply. These are still bias supply. So this is kind of that look that every kid had when he went to school back in the 70s. It's awesome, yeah. A bias tire design allows the tire's body to flex easily providing a very smooth ride on rough surfaces. 
However, it came with a significant disadvantage, as the tire would lose control and traction at high speeds. In 1967, Goodyear created the Polyglass Tire, which was a bias-belted tire equipped with a wider tread and belts made of fiberglass. It was a safer and more reliable tire design, which began appearing on passenger cars like the Plymouth Cuda in the late 60s. However, the Polyglass Tire and its competitors were eventually replaced by steel-belted radials. This one the manual top, 318 three-speed, this is the entry level. If you wanted the basic, inex most inexpensive Barracuda convertible on the planet, that's the car. Manual drum brakes, three-speed transmission, manual top. But then you get over to this car, which is a couple interesting things is, now on the Cuda package, again, this is a BS car. BS is Barracuda, S is special, meaning this is the Cuda, right? Standard on the Cuda in 1970 were these hood pins standard. If you got a CUDA, you got hood pins. But these running lamps, these road lamps, factory calls them road lamps, those were standard in the actual CUDA package in 70, whereas in 71 they were optional. Yep. The gills, the rocker gills, those are uh, standard on all 70 CUDAs Cudas. on yep. a CUDA model. The Grand Coupe, standard, had a louvered one that you see on there. Yeah, it's got the ribs. And then the Barracuda would have had nothing there. You could have added it. Yep, like and if you one. did add it to a Barracuda, you would have just gotten a straight bar down the side of it. Let's take a look at what the ghouls accomplished this episode. The team came together and installed the exhaust for our legendary 1971 Phantom Cuda. Everybody give them the grin. Bro. Will successfully painted the very transparent and difficult to spray FK5 Burn Orange for a 1970 Plymouth Cuda. The nerve wracking part is what if the final paint doesn't come out as nice as the pre-paint? Dave and Alyssa wrapped up the rear end for the Phantom Cuda, inching it closer and closer to its finish line. We got the gills in. I mean, we did a lot of stuff, all the marker lights. It looks cool. And after detailing the differences between the three newly arrived restorations, the ghouls are ready to take them out for a test drive. I want to go for a drive. It's a perfect day. Back in the day, out on the cruise trip, you'd see cars like this, exactly the way they look. You know, and you'd be out there waving them, giving them, you know, thumbs up and stuff. I mean, all your buddies out there in their cars, and you'd see, along with all the Mopars, all the Chevelles and Mustangs, I mean, everybody had muscle cars back then. You know, and this is what they looked like, and boy, it brings back tons these, of memories. These, I mean, these were the panty collectors, though. Oh, yeah, these yeah. were. This is yeah. amazing. I mean, this is You drive awesome. by in a Chevelle SS 396, and the girl's like, those are the rosary, right? The guy drives by in a Cuda 446 barrel four speed, and it's panty time, oh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, maybe a bra. I saw panties all the time. I collected them. Not in a weird way. No. It's a new age. Nowadays, they're all doing that over little bitty Hondas that are slammed to the ground and have rice rocket garbage sound. Oh, that car couldn't be any smoother. Uh, it drove great. Brakes felt good. The top worked great. Steering was phenomenal on it. That, that car is a great driving car. This is the first time I've got to drive a car off a lot ever, so that was pretty cool. Thanks, Dad. Earning privileges back a little at a time, a little at a time. Oh, tons of power. You gotta love the 446 barrel. Uh, as, as far as wheels goes, mine did not steer very good. It was just meant to go fast in a straight line because you gotta turn the wheel a complete turn just to, before it'll start to move. So a <laughs> uh, typical e-body that's been driven hard. So yeah, but it was awesome. I love it. Yeah, and it's just a, you know, just a couple, three daily driver cars, but pretty good testimony to the style and the quality and the impression that those vehicles have made over the last 50 years.